up to you now. Hi, can you hear me? Am yeah. I coming through? Great. Uh, I am so excited for today as well, Amanda, and it's like all the things that you said. Um, we've had such amazing response from people who are, are dialing in with us, and uh, and for me, um, it's been really great to hear people's questions and prod my thinking because every one of these has been like a, a real intellectual adventure for me as I try and walk down these these paths of information and sort out what happened and what it all means. And so it's been really exciting. But these guests today are particularly amazing. And um, one way that I want to share that with you is I just want to I want to um, show you a real short clip here of something that um, I did the other day with Abby and Abby uh, decided that she was willing to teach me to drive a Model T. So here's a short clip of that. Um, uh, you may need to adjust your sound. I'm not sure how it's gonna come through. So please adjust your sound quality accordingly, but here it is. Drive one. Um, first thing, about how old were you when you learned to drive? Eight. So you drove a Model T when you were eight years old? Yes. And you had a driver's license? No. No. <laughs> okay. We won't discuss anything else about that. <laughs> but what I would like you to do uh, is uh, to get ready to teach me this, tell me some of the things I need to know about a, a T and some things that are really different from a, the car I know how to drive. So you have two levers here. This one's spark which really doesn't do anything other than once you get it started. This one is basically your gas pedal. So when you would normally press the gas to go forward, that's what you're gonna move down or up to go faster or slow down. Uh, handbrake, this is clutch, reverse and brake. Um, clutch, uh, all the way out is high gear, halfway is neutral, and then all the way down is low gear. So normally you just push it all the way to the floor, then when you ready to go faster, push and pull down the lever, and then once it gets going fast enough, you'll push the lever up, let your foot out, and put the lever back down. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I don't got it, but maybe. Um, and what about, what's this um, That's thing? the key. So when you turn your car on, you'll, we will turn it to the right, or left, I mean, so that it goes to battery, and then you'll have to crank start it. Uh -huh. Can you crank start it for me? Yes, now? When it's time? Yes. Okay, good. Well, um, what are all the other things I, I might want to know? Um, when you are coming to a stop, you have to make sure that you put the clutch halfway and then press the brake or it will stall. Oh, because, because neutral will... was halfway? Yeah. So low, because... neutral, high. Correct. Okay, good. Um, What else? Is that a starter? That we get started with that and see how it works? Probably. Okay. Um, let's do it. Okay. Okay, so Magneto's over. Oh, you're giving it more gas. Oh, there's more gas here. Yeah. Right, more gas. 
and then there may need more when they're producing it. Uh, right now. And then down to the road. Do I need to feed it for the end? Down to the road. Okay, we're back. Is everything uh, hunky dory? People with us still? Okay, good. Um, so that was a tremendous amount of fun, but I think it really gives you a window on on uh, on Abby a little bit. So let's jump right in with some content. Um, I want to do a real quick recap of some previous ideas before we move into our discussion of women and teenagers. And keeping in mind um, that, and and it, it's always so hard to choose what material to to present because we're just scratching the the very surface where we got the tip of the iceberg but i'm trying to get some central ideas here that i hope will help you help you organize your thinking and give you avenues of questions to ask um, in the future so uh with that let me move into our presentation material um we asked earlier and we start each section with this about the the central idea that um that history is unique and special it doesn't repeat itself but because humans have this enduring quality in their nature that humans repeat themselves. And so we can learn about ourselves by looking at the past. And in fact, in reality, all we ever do is look at the past. Everything we know is based on something that happened yesterday or the day before. And so every, uh, every one of us is always historians. And so, but the formal study of, of history is about looking at the meaning and trying to say what that means and how does that inform me? It's not just a bunch of facts and information, but what does it all mean? And at the heart of this is the idea of agency. Somebody made a choice, somebody makes decisions. Right now, you're gonna be making a decision and the sum of all the decisions that you make is what history is. In the future, people will look back and they'll be simply looking at the choices we made. And so when we look back, we have to look at the choices they made. And we have to represent, uh, recognize that it's multi-causal, that there's a lot of people making choices, that people make choices that contradict what other choices they make, and it's super complex. And so that kind of formulates and underpins our study. And then the final thing to remember is that the scope is so vast. There's so many different issues involved in the history of the automobile. And so we're starting to develop a model here as we go through this process that takes a look at those. And so the very first one was we looked at road trips and we looked at how the, um, the very first road trips created and impacted the advent of the automobile. And then we looked at how road trips shapes our lives. And after that, we started looking at the system of forces that were the antecedents to the automobile about how the automobile was kind of like waiting to happen because there were all these roadways and firms and manufacturing but more importantly this gives us gives us a sense of how really complex the system is that automobiles exist in a complex system of firms and roadways and and it doesn't work without all these in place um and so that was our second presentation our third presentation took a look at how the automobile shaped the world around us with mega corporations and globalizations and key technologies and now we're adding another another dimension into our presentations we're looking at the interaction of women and teenagers both how women and teenagers shape the history of the automobile but also how the automobiles shape the history of women and teenagers. And so that's our direction today. And one of the things um, I think that's important to keep in mind is first the context of life of men and women. There have always been separate spheres, but the term separate spheres is something that was coined to describe the world of the 1890s and 1919 teens, where there really was a very, very stark, far more stark than present, division between the worlds that men live and women live, where women's role was dominated, absolutely dominated by the household and the commercial and political world was absolutely completely dominated by men. And now there's obviously still a vast difference in how those things work between the genders, but it's nothing like it was in the past. And so when the automobile enters on the on, into, onto the scene, it has kind of very special effect. And the special effect of the automobile is because whenever you have a new technology emerge and something changes in the technology, it's not clear about exactly 
where that belongs in the map of gender responsibilities and roles. For example, when the telephone was inv invented in switchboards, there was no defined you know, role model that said that all switchboard operators had to be a certain gender. So there was no rules regarding it. So quickly that became a, a place of opportunity. If you think about your cliche in your image of the switchboard operator, it's a, it's a, it's a woman's uh, uh, idea we have associated with it. But at any rate, so when the car emerges, it's still full of kind of the things because it's a bicycle and, or excuse me, it's like a carriage and extension, which was pretty much a man's world. But the bicycle was a universal world for both men and women. And so when it comes into the world, it has a lot of doors to open. I want to point out once again, Carl and Bertha Benz. The Bertha Benz, we talked about this in the first road trip. The first gal, to, the first person, excuse me, the very first person to jump in a car and take off on a long road trip. And she was a, an equal partner, a co-creator of the automobile with her husband, Carl Benz in 1886. When we get to 1900, I wanna throw out this, the first driver's license in the United States, first woman's driver's license was on January 1st, 1900. Um, and this was in the city of Washington, DC. There were no state requirements for driver's license at that time. Um, it, was, it was something that, um, that states would not adapt, ad, uh, adopt for several years and some states for 10 years or even 20 years. But there were a couple cities that were beginning to uh, encourage them or require them. And here's an article I saw from Horseless Age magazine. It was a 1900 article. And it was uh, a city uh, official in the city of Chicago talking about licensing. And he said, eight women have secured permits to operate electric vehicles in Chicago. Uh, he didn't say, he was just talking about Chicago. But there are 25 to 50 women regularly running the machine through the city. And so what I want to make sure you understand with this is the women, women and the automobile were tied together from the very beginning. This is not a technology that started out as a man's technology and then women crossed over or vice versa. This is something that women were engaged with from the very beginning. And there's some reasons for that that we can talk about later. Now I want to kind of zero in on three small subtopics that help illuminate this. And the first one I want to talk about is Joan Newton Cunio. This woman is amazing and I encourage you to look up her biography. It's a phenomenal story. But she becomes a, a, an avid motorist in 1902 when she gets her first car and she just loves tooling around in this thing. And so in 1905, she registers for the AAA Reliability Tour. Um, it had started in 1904, the Reliability Tour, but in 1905, there was a, um, a wealthy patron named Glidden who associated a cup with it. From So thereafter, it became known as a Glidden tour. So the first AAA reliability tour is in 1904, but the first Glidden tour is in 1905. She applies for it. She's going to go on it. She gets a letter back from the AAA. It says, sorry, it's only for men. She goes to the rule books. She looks at the rules and she says, there's nothing about men. And it sends back the letter and says, you're going to let me in. They let her in. But when she gets on tour as they're approaching the ascent of Mount Washington, that's when they stop her and they say, ascending this hill is just far too dangerous. We can't let you do it because it's men only. Nonetheless, despite this, she uh, follows through. She goes the 840 miles, she goes the rest of the tour. There's uh, 34 cars that start. There's 27 that finish. She's one of the finished, but she didn't complete it because she was not allowed to ascend Mount Washington. And, and this did not slow her down. I mean, this is something that strengthened her convention. Uh, she went back to the Glidden door the next year, finished it and completed it. Went back the next year, finished and completed. And then she became a full-time race car driver. And she was really something tearing up the, top, the uh, tracks. And what um, many biographies called like the crowning moment was the Mardi Gras races of, of New Orleans in 1909. This is the spring of 1909. And so there was a whole series of races. And so she sent for the application forms and and the, the sponsors contacted her back and said, well, which one of our races do you want to enter in? And she said, I want to be in all of them. So she entered in every race, every category, everything possible. She walked away with three wins, two second places. And one of her second places was against uh, Ralph De Palma, who came in first. And Ralph De Palma, De Palma was the definitive race car driver of the period. And this made a huge sensation. And then the AAA bans women from racing very shortly thereafter. Um, 
this is this was a crushing thing for her. She was really disappointed, but it didn't stop her from driving. She began setting women's speed records. Um, in that same year, in 1909, January of 1909, was when Alice Ramsey, we talked about Alice Ramsey earlier for her transcontinental ride in 1909. Alice Ramsey organized the first all-women car race, and so all-women car races were emerging. So the AAA um, ban would become significant. Um, the AAA was the major sanctioning body in auto racing. However, other bodies would emerge and then women would re-enter um, as uh, significant race car drivers, beginning with the first season of NASCAR in, uh, shortly after World War II. And so that's Joan Newton Cunio, and it tells a really significant story. Another story I'd like to tell you about is the manufacturers. The manufacturers were interested in women drivers from the very beginning. And clearly among these was Pope with the Pope Waverly Electric. And um, this is one of the uh, best well uh, discussed features of the automobile that the electric really fit with women at the turn of the century because it didn't have to conflict with other uh, parts of their gender roles of uh, feminine, femininity. And I want you to look at these ads here. And the first one on the left, the 1903 Pope Waverly ad, this is two women on their own in a Waverly electric. But even more interesting is the 1904 ad. If you look at this, September 1904, this is really interesting because it's a woman driving a man. This is a woman in her Pope, and this is 1904. So the, the women were falling in love with these electrics because um, they did not have to compromise their clothes. They did not have to make a broader social statement. They could simply say, I just like cars. This doesn't have a meaning. You don't have to interpret it. I'm not trying to upset the apple cart. I just like cars. And Joan Cunio, in fact, said that directly in, in her biography. She writes that she was asked once someone challenged her, said, well, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to, are you trying to, you know, upset the world? Are you trying to change the whole way we do things. And she said, no, I just love to drive cars. I want to drive cars. And so advertising, car manufacturers, they began to direct their advertising at women drivers. And to this day, advertisements and marketing aimed at the women market is a fundamental part of modern advertising. And the one on the right is a later one. And once again, this emphasizes that the automobile was something that was feminine as well as masculine, and this goes back to the very earliest days. A second feature, the a third feature I want to um, discuss is the role of the automobile in the suffragette movement. Beginning around 19, uh, the suffragette movement in the United States goes back to, uh, usually the origins are cited as a, as a social movement to the 1860s, a series of conventions, some in the 1840s, but they really began to pick up uh, speed around the turn of the century. And beginning around 1910, because women had gained such a strong affinity for automobiles, and automobiles was freedom, it was independence, it was a chance to get away. And it, 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 it cut in two ways. If you were in the urban landscape, it gave you a chance on your own to go out in a town, um, to go out and leave the population and move to lesser densities, to parks, for example, or meet socially on your own terms. And in the rural environment, it had an even import, more important um, impact in the opposite direction, to take you towards population density, to escape the countryside, to go into towns, to, to meet people and spend time together. Because for months, much of, uh, much of American history, women in the rural community spent their lives in isolation. Aside from attending church on occasion, and, um, they were basically prisoners on their own farms. And this is not a universal statement, but it was a very common statement. And so the automobile became so important. Um, there was another transcontinental attempt I want to point to in 1916, when this was a votes for woman uh, banner on top of their Saxon runabout, uh, painted yellow, all the way across the United States, carrying the banner. And then in 1970, the 50th anniversary of the women's right to vote, a commemorative stamp from the United States. And as you can see, we're, we're flying along here, but we got to fly along because we got so many great stuff to do. And so I, I just want to suggest these are some great ways to rethink, to rethink of that the automobile and women are welded together from the very beginning. It's not something, it's not a change that happened. It's not a transition. And the trajectory of this transition has been continuous. There's been big gaps and some of them have closed. You know, men had far more licenses. That's not true anymore. Women 
uh, men owned far more cars. That's not true anymore. Car ownership is split. Men used to log all the private mileage, but now they don't. But still, there's an important divide here. There's significant divides in professional opportunities within the automobile industry and in all aspects of the automobile. There's uh, significant differences in commercial mileage in our society. Still, people tend to think of the garage as a male space. People think of the racetrack as a male place. Many, many people, not everybody, many, many. And then, of course, there's an odd anomaly about commute length. It turns it women commute on average far more uh, distances than men do. And so this is an interesting divide and worth, it, worth discussing. I hope we get to that. Now I want to push on to the teenager. And I have some really interesting questions. And this may seem like a kind of set of bizarre questions, but actually, I think you'll find the answers very telling. First, what is a teenager? Well, um, it's clear that there's something about being 13 to 19, but that's not what a teenager is about. For example, if I tell you I'm 61 years old, all of a sudden it has a bunch of ways that you would think about me different than a teenager. So there's all these things associated with it. And if I told you I was five years old, you'd have a whole bunch, you would probably wouldn't believe me, but you'd have a whole other set of ideas that you would associate with this idea of the ages. And so to un understand what a teenager is, you have to ask yourself about what these things that you associate with being a teenager. And part of them that are fundamental in our society is in our society, being a teenager is a time that there is a special level of latitude where you say, we know you're going to get out there and do some pretty crazy stuff. And that goes with the territory. And I also know that this is a, any, every parents, this is, a, you know, part of the big mystery of being a parent is, you know, it's time that they're going to start pushing back. You know, they're finding out who they are. They're exploring their identities and meanings and significance in ways that they haven't done. And it's, we know that it's going to be painful, right? We know that it, the being a teenager is really a tough place to be. And these are things we know about teenagers. But what I, but the second question maybe catches you really is even more bizarre is when was the teenager invented? And the answer, oddly enough, and we'll get to this, the extinction of the teenager, the teenager was invented in around 1920. And this is a really bizarre answer, but the teenager as we know it, the teenager that has dominated, dominated our thinking was actually a creation of the 1920s and it was a creation of the automobile. And sociologists and social historians and demographers and all kinds of academic people have been studying this for a long time. And this is actually a, a very important answer. There were a whole series of changes. For example, starting at the top left, the automobile changes school culture completely because now you have a lot more mobility, especially through the bus as a, as a locomotion. It means that you have the advent of consolidated schools. You have all of a sudden people going from very small country schoolhouses that are like located every two or three miles on a country lane. Now they're going, all going into town. So you have this emergence of this big mixing pole of teens that are seeing each other and communicating with each other. And I've always thought the crucible of culture is in high school. That's where all the, all the life-changing ideas and social media ideas and crazy language and stuff comes out of high school. But it's that mixing bowl is created for the first time. The school extracurricular activities are created, which means there's a new extra demand for mobility. You have increased years of mandatory education. So this cultural imprint um, is effective on the teenage cohort for an even longer time. And of course you have the replacement of the, the automobile replacing the, the porch swing, the next category down. This has been commented again and again and again, that this is the advent. And by the way, I want to make sure we differentiate here between urban America and rural America, because there's two very, the porch spring was not, the porch swing was not a big feature of urban America, but the chaperoned supervised dating was. And so all of a sudden you can have a, a teen get out in a car on their own and have unsupervised dating. And we know that changes everything. Add that to another dynamic that because of increasing educational opportunity demands and expectations for education, dating, the marriage age gets delayed. And I think that the marriage age in the United States is something around 28 right now, or not quite that old, and it depends on gender. But, but people are getting um, mar married later and later and later. Um, add that then to the mixing of the gene pool. I mean, um, if you're living in a rural community where the same families have been living in that community, very few people and very few people leaving that community for 
um, for 100 years or so, or 60 years, or 70 years, or even 30 years, you're going to find that all of a sudden, just about everybody you know is a third cousin or a second cousin. And all of a sudden, this transition to the automobile increased the opportunities to meet people that were not real, real relatives. And this is an energizing, and this is exciting. And there was a sexual revolution that was a result of this, that the sexual norms and sexual values and sexual sexual practices changed. And this was ongoing with others. So we have this, this is an engine that invigorates and excites the teenager and gets them all fired up for the automobile. And now we go to the upper right-hand corner, this kind of idea of youth community. We've talked about how the, the school created, but now you have an opportunity for social connectivity in a way that people didn't have before. And it's cruising. The idea, you get in your car and you see and you be seen. You get out in the community. It's how you show you who you are and it's how you identify other people. At the same time, you have a technological change in music. And it's really interesting to think that for the overwhelming majority of human history, either the musician was with you or you didn't hear the music. That was it. But for the first time, you have the beginning of recorded music. 1920s is the very, very beginning. Almost no one has music sources, but it would grow with gramophones and eventually record players in 1930s, 40s becoming. But for the overwhelming part of this um, period, it was a social practice because somebody had to have the record player. There had to be the jukebox. And so this structure of music becomes tied to dance, transitions and dance. And another thing I want to emphasize is this happens in a context where 50% of the United States was rural. A population in 1920 was roughly 106 million people, 50% rural population. And then you have the advent of the hot rod. And this is dependent on cheap junkers and parts, compared to modern skills, the skills were pretty simple, compared to modern tools, they were pretty simple tools. There was, if you were in the countryside, this highly rural population, there was lots of shop space. And given the size and density, even in the cities, there was lots of parking. There was always a plen plenty of place. And now the demise, the changing world and the changing team. And this is one of the biggest riddles in automotive history. And we can simply look at these simple barriers. We can say really, you know, the, the school remained consolidated. They began in, in continued extracurricular activities. But now when we look down to the replacement of the torch swing, there's been a sexual revolution, a second revolution. And that sexual revolution is one that um, sex is more risky than it was 50 years ago. And teens know this. And there's a lot of data that teens are having less sex than they were 30 years ago and 40 years and 50 years ago, that this generation behaves very differently. Furthermore, Sex was something you had to really run away from your family to become involved in and conceal in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s even. But now there's an increasing norm where parents want to be open with their children and they want to be there for them and they want to talk about their sexual relationships and be connected with them in that way. And this creates a whole different demand for the teenager to have a place to go hide. And so the back seat is in decline. I mean, and this is an, an interesting feature. And now let's look at these communities. Look at social connectivity. You don't have to get in a car to be socially connected. And there's every meme you ever saw on the internet that's out there looking at the roles of teens, walking down, walking down the street um, with a phone, uh, staring at what's going on there. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, an object of criticism, but you know what? It's socially connected. And you don't have to go to a jukebox because everybody's got their own music on that device. And then the demographic change. The United States is only 18% rural right now. That means the demand to get away from these distant places is reduced. So the fundamentally central nature of the automobile has been transformed for that cohort. And the age of the hot rod, look what's happened to that? Cheap junkers are harder to come by. It's, well, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons why you can buy really bad cars, but it takes a lot more skill to work on them than it used to. It took a lot, the parts are far more specialized in the tools, the electronics, the computers, the knowledge is far more specialized. Shop space with the growing size of urban communities, especially moving to an urban, urban world has been transformed. And so there's a lot less of it and there is not a lot of parking everywhere. There was a lot of parking when everybody lived on a farm or half the population, but not now. And so we have this fundamental change, a fundamental change in the roles of women and teens. Um, 
I, uh, I Googled, I was, you know, I'm thinking, I want to, I want to get some ideas of ways to think about this. So I Googled teen and car and the first like 200 hits where it was called like how to buy the ideal car for your teen, what car should you get from your team? And the two words that kept coming was cheap, safe, cheap, safe, cheap, safe. And I thought, man, you know, are, is that going to inspire a generation to love cars? You know, is that is that where it should be, be headed? Because the direction we want to go with our discussion today is not just to understand it, but to talk about let's get some let's get some explanation of how people are relating to the car, and and so we're going to turn our attention, we're going to turn our attention to Tabitha and and Abby, and I do want to, and I do want to make sure I emphasize here that um, just like I'm providing like some. Uh, I'm providing some kind of tip of the iceberg views of this vast history. When we talked to Tabitha, I did not ask Tabitha to speak on behalf of all women here. She's here to tell a story and I'm not here asking Abby to represent all teenagers uh, all and all women in the world. They're here because they have really interesting narratives and the question of how, how does how does the automobile impact your life is what we're here to talk about at this class. How has it changed the world? And so let me, let me just flip it over to you. Hi, Tabitha, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Good, awesome okay. Thanks thank so much. And so um, I, I would like you to please jump in and, and what are your thoughts today? Yeah, you know, it's, it's such a big topic. Both of those topics, both women in automotive and the aspect of teenagers, we could spend hours talking about both of them, but um, the automobile in general, one of my favorite quotes coming from Beverly Ray Kimes, who, um, if you're not familiar, is, is noted as the first lady of the hobby, an automotive journalist and historian who was never a car girl to begin with. She was a journalist. She became a car girl through the experiences. And one of my favorite quotes from hers, no other industry, no other entity, combines the sparkling cast of unforgettable characters, the drama, the comedy, the tragedy, the whole spectrum of life, like the saga of how the world was put on wheels. That yeah. sums it up. I mean, yeah. just the people, the experiences, everything is driven by the automobile and, and it's uh, such a, a fantastic part of our lives. Good, good, good. So uh, tell me, tell us more, um, would you, Tabitha, could you tell us a little bit more about what connects you to the automobile? What is it in, on your personal experience that makes this uh, so engaging and so fascinating? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's Amanda alluded to earlier, it, it started for me in antique tractor restoration of all things. It, it all started with a rusty John Deere. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say it probably started even before that. My father and grandfather had old cars around the farm I grew up on in Colorado. We were never car people. We never went to clubs or car shows. It wasn't a hobby for us. It was just kind of what I grew up around. And, um, but the idea, the, the agency of working with my hands, right, working in the shop, I was the gopher for my dad, going for this yeah. school or that. And um, when the opportunity started with the, the tractor restoration for uh, this national contest through Chevron, this, why not? How fun is that? Right. And that's, that's really where it started. And I can say that my entire life now has been from the influence of that rusty tractor and carried on through the car space. And um, in my, my personal relationships, my best friends, my non-blood family are all because of the automobile. Awesome. Hi, Abby. How you doing? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so glad. Um, I, had you seen that clip already, the one that I showed at the beginning? No. Okay, great. You were great, by the way. Uh, so I'm so glad you're with us. Tell us, what are some of your thoughts as you listen to what we've talked about today and, and some of the topics and what's your kind of your response to that? Um, I think that, you know, just like what you said, cars, they're, they're less necessary now that there's cell phones and stuff like that. So teenagers, they don't have to get in a car to go be with their friends or whatever. So now, you know, teenagers, they know they can stay home. They don't have to go out. Yeah. And 
um, I mean, for me still, cars are a huge part of my life, especially with car tours, with friends, family, that sort of thing. So it's very important to me. But others, you know, it's not as important for them yeah. to have a car because, you know, their parents can drive them or they can walk. Or they can just call the person. But you know, I I think what I've I think of what I've heard from both of you is kind of a narrative when we talked about the role of the automobile and community building, that how it becomes part of the connectivity of your life. And what I hear both of you saying is the car is like some of the glue that holds you to the people you love, your families and, and how are you were raised and it, it makes sense out of the memories of your life and puts it into the context of the way you live now. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, um, at the end of the day, the automobile was built with one purpose, and that was transportation. Yeah. Um, but there's such self-expression within the automobile. And even in current times, somebody goes to the dealership to buy a car, whether they claim or, or consider themselves a car person or not, there's an extension of their personality in what they choose to drive most often. Yeah. Absolutely. And whether new car or old car, and throughout history, the design of automobiles has changed extensively. And I think the idea of driving has changed um, from enjoyment to commodity. And, um, you know, there's, there's such a difference between commuting and driving for enjoyment in my, in my mind. Yeah. Does, does your, do your friends get it, Abby? Do they think you're, your tea is cool and wicked and awesome or uh, uh my friends they they don't really understand they're like why would you want to go in, go get into something that only goes 35 miles an hour why don't you want to oh. go in something that goes 75 and you can go wherever you want quickly yeah. so they're kind of they think it's cool to look at but they don't understand why i want to drive and go on tours and go 35 instead of 75 down the highway yeah. Well, you know what? Maybe you should start teaching them some of them to drive it. But when you taught me, to, no, seriously, when you taught me to drive that, I've I've read about the T forever. I've studied the T, everything imaginable about production and numbers. But when I wrote in that, when you taught me to drive it, it fundamentally changed my understanding from the ground up of the T. And maybe that's, you know, I, I've heard that there's a lot of organizations that engage um, the next generation by putting them in old cars and tooling them around and that that's a transformative experience. And that might be, that, that's certainly part of that, that formula. How often, how often do you roll up your sleeves, get on your work suit and tear into a car, Abby? Well, since I've been building my own Model T, it's, and since I've had more time with the virus and everything, um, it's been like either every day or every couple of days. So uh -huh. And I know you do that all the time, Tabitha. Every, every, I see you like all the time on virtual, <laughs> in the virtual world. I see you out there ripping stuff apart and that's. Yeah, you know, it's, it's part of my zen. That's the, that's the getaway, the therapy. And kudos to Abby. You are fantastic, A, for driving a Model T because that driving experience is a whole nother level beyond just an old car. And um, the, there, there are so many nuances of that to begin with. And um, I, I think the working on it is, it all goes hand in hand. Um, knowing it from the inside out and the mechanical side of it and just being a part of the car. And you talk about women throughout history and the early drivers and even on your electric vehicles, there was such a, a component of you're driving the car. The modern cars, you you more so just pilot it. It's just steering it. You're not really driving. Abby is driving that Model T, every yeah. piece of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's connected. That's so cool. That's so cool. Okay, um, I want to I wanna make sure we open up the doors here for Amanda because I know Amanda's um, been getting some responses uh, from people that are with us. And so I want to make sure we have some, some time for Q&A. So... Hi, Amanda. Hi. Hello. Do I, may I tell a story first? Abby hates the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like my Abby Paulson story. I was learning to drive a Model T probably when she was 10 and had just learned how to drive one. She knows where I'm going with this. 
and I was in McPherson and I was doing fine because I didn't have to stop or slow down or I, just driving. Well, then I got to a four-way stop in McPherson. And for those of you who don't know, McPherson's not a big town. And so four-way stop is not usually any kind of challenge in McPherson. But I got there and the T stalled. And I panicked because there were cars everywhere. And I look over on the corner and Abby's there on her bicycle. And she just kind of looks at me and smiles and goes, <laughs> and I thought I should have just had her come start it and drive me home. It was embarrassing because I knew she could she could drive so much better than I could. And I still haven't learned. But now that I know she's taught you, I'm going to have her. I'm going to have to schedule some time with her. If so I can learn, it must be easy, Amanda. So, <laughs> actually, I didn't Tam say that. <laughs> I know. I Tam say that. Just like it. Tamitha, you had a really funny story about Abby, too. I'm sorry, we're doing this as family <laughs> hour oh here. But yeah. go ahead. This is, I mean, this is a wonderful story. I just, I adore Abby and everything that you represent and, and do. And um, when I was a student at McPherson College, gosh, Abby, I, I can't even remember how old you were at that point, but um, six, seven, eight, somewhere around there. Um, and we were in the metal lab back at the foundry. So McPherson College has a, a foundry class and, and Chris, Abby's father, uh, was in there with us and we're talking and Abby was just pointing at things. She goes, yeah, I know what that is. I know what that is. And she was telling me how she remembered her grandfather pouring Babbitt bearings. And I, I was taken back and I just wanted to wrap my arms around you and say, you are my hero. <laughs> I yeah. loved it. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really important to recognize that we hear a lot in, in the industry that young people don't care about these old cars, but I don't think they're getting exposed to them. I'm mean, certainly Abby's experience is not one that every teenager is going to have the, the ability to experience. I and mean, she's been immersed in these since, since she was young. But I do think, and Tabitha, in your work uh, that you've done with Haggerty and just personally your own passion, um, the way that you have engaged young people and given them that experience. Because to Ken's point, the first time you ride in a Model T, it is not what you expect. It's, yeah, you look at it, you think, ah, old slow car. But then you get in it and, and just that whole experience of the sounds and the smells and the air blowing and the bugs on the front grill. I mean, it's just, it's really a great experience. And so um, I love having the two of you here. I do have a, a question. I have a few questions. Um, Abby, have you, since we're, since we're focused on you right now, Abby, this one's directly for you. Abby, have you driven a Model T off-road? Um, I've driven down dirt roads, not necessarily like through a wheat field or something, but through dirt roads that, you know, aren't traveled very often. We did that when, um, it was last year, we went on a tour in Wyoming, and so we were driving through dirt roads over cattle guards and yeah. So. so when you go on these family trips, uh, you know, when I was growing up, dad was the, my dad was the driver. And then when I got old enough to drive, he he was great at relinquishing that to, to me or to my brother and letting us drive. Does your dad give you a lot of time behind the wheel when you're on these tours? Yeah, um, he ba it's usually, you know, Abby, do you want to drive? And if I say yes, then I can. And if I'm, you know, not in the mood, then I don't have to. But I get to when I want. Because your because your mom drives too, and I think your little sister's learning, right? Yeah. So you have to go on long tours to give people the chance, everybody a chance to drive. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut in here. Abby, do you, have, do you have a guess? Any how many miles you have behind the wheel of a T? Any wild guess? Probably cl closer to 500. I mean, less than that, but around. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Cool. That's great. Okay, uh, here's a question. Since women dominated the domestic space, is it accurate to say that the automobile could be viewed as an extension of the domestic space? Women and mothers could use it for shopping, for shuttling children around, et cetera. And in more modern ads, women are depicted in family cars and more often men or childless women are pictured in more sportier versions. So was the car uh, an extension of the domestic space for women? Let me ask about from your experiences. Let's start with uh, Tabitha and Ab I have a historical answer for that. But, yeah, you know, you know I, I, I think there's absolutely some relevancy to that. I think um, the automobile changed 
everything about the home life. There, there was the ability to travel over to the next city, um, to go shopping. I mean, you, you started to see a little bit more development of um, the, the commercial side of, of things where people were able to more easily travel and, and faster. And um, from a domestic side, it totally changed everything. Um, uh, you, you, had, you were a more easily able to have your family with you and you still see that today. And um, you know, there's, there's a reason why minivans are, are called soccer mom vehicles. <laughs> you know? So yeah. uh, I, I, I would completely agree with that. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Abby, about that, to, that world? That's probably not where you spend a lot of time. Th um, I think, you know, cars, they've, they've kind of become like part of my summer or part of my life. So, you know, going on the car tour during the summer, that's like my, you know, I'm going to a home because, you know, there's friends, there's close friends, they're like family. Mm -hmm. So it, it is like just a continuation of being at home. Yeah. Well, from when social historians look at the 20th century and the roles of women, some of the key things they point to are that um, the idea of the labor saving device, like the washing machine or the electric, the automobile is the, the absolute ultimate labor saving device to fulfill your obligations in the household. And because of other changes that were happening, like the electric light, which meant that when women were better able to fulfill their social obligations to fulfill their roles in the household, all of a sudden women for the first time had both more time and an opportunity to use it because of the, it meant that they could now go to night school. There was no night schools because there was no electric lights. And so the, the workplaces, um, there was a new demand to have factories open 24 hours a day. And so this happened because of electrical lighting. So a dovetail of all these um, technological forces makes the automobile very much the extension of the household. That's such a great question. Yeah. So we have a question about the decreasing number of younger people driving, especially in non-rural areas, and how will that impact our car hobbies? And why do you think there's a lack of diversity in car clubs? So kind of two questions there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll jump into this one if you don't mind. This is right up my alley on all aspects. Um, you know, so so it's, it's definitely known and, and um, that young people are waiting longer to get their driver's licenses. Um, there's been a decrease of teenagers getting their permits and licenses. Um, we at Haggerty did a study on this a few years ago and the results of that was actually that um, it's not that they're not getting them, it's just that they're waiting longer. And especially in those non-rural areas when you think about the access to transportation that they have, um, and then the barriers of the cost of owning and operating an automobile. Um, you have public transportation, you have the generation of helicopter parents that take their children everywhere they wanna go. Um, but the desire to drive is most often still there. Um, there's also factors that young people are waiting longer to get married, to have children. This kind of goes back to that domestic side where they don't need an automobile right away. Um, from a college aspect, thankfully McPherson College is not this way, um, but a lot of universities don't allow freshmen or sophomore to have their car on campus. So then it's just non-use non of there. So um, in terms of the, the car world, um, the club aspect is, um, I think that is a, a trend across all hobbies as well, not just the car world. Um, people, younger people especially, are looking for one-off experiences, not that club aspect. Um, they don't value membership as much as older generations do. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they, they're not interested. That's the key. There is a huge huge audience of young car people. But keep in mind, they may not like the same cars or participate in the same way as what we think the traditional hobby is. Yeah, I, I have another answer for that as well. Is it because of these, the process of creating the teenage engagement in the automobile took a long, long time. It was because of 
changes, but the typical teenager in 1910 was not a Carnot or 1920 or 1930 even. It was a slow process. And I think it was a slow process of welding people's dreams to the car. And so the process of the evolving teenager one was all of a sudden teenagers could see their aspects and their futures of how they were going to cruise, how are they going to spend time slowly evolved into the system. But because of the rapid systems of changes, there's been a, a fracture in that connectivity. And so I think the challenge to reinvigorate this is to reevaluate exactly how do we tie a car to the dreams of this generation? How do we look at them and say, no, I know the things that you have. You have different demand for security than the experiential experimental 70s or the crazy 50s. You have a, a different, all kinds of different demands and things that you're seeking. And now let's talk about the car that moves into that new teenager. Whereas a lot of what we've been doing thus far and a lot of it very successful is trying to rebuild the bridges to that past connectivity. But, but I think it's really about, it, about, about looking at Abby and say, here's this fabulous human and that she's got dreams and aspirations and let's talk about how the car can be part of those. I think like even just being at my high school, you know, people, they don't, they don't know that they're there and they, especially antiques like, you know, that my family has, you know, early teens, they don't know that you can drive them and they don't even know that they really exist. Like, I can be driving around and they're like, you have those. And I'm like, yeah, we have more than one. And they just don't understand that they're there and you can buy them and you can drive them. And I think that also comes from, you know, there's a lot of museums. Like I love going to see cars in museums, but those cars don't get driven very often. And there's a lot of, you know, people who like to collect them, but not necessarily let people see them or drive them or ride in them. Which is interesting, Abby, because you think about how many old cars they probably your friends probably see in McPherson that's a higher number than in most towns because of all the diverse cars our students bring with them as projects that they, they come in. So it's not unusual to see some of these old cars around McPherson, and yet it still isn't something that they feel connected to or, or, or really aware of because they haven't experienced it yet. Uh, Amanda, I see what I see. One of those questions in chat that I'm looking at right now. I know this is your job to pick them up, but there's one from well, Nicole. Yeah, they're in two different places, so I'm trying oh, to. Try okay. To go, ahead. go ahead. Can you grab that one? And Nicole yeah. says, "How how do you think the automobile impacted women's success in the suffrage movement? In what ways?" Well, there's a lot of literature on this, and it, there was a, such a strong connection. Um, the suffrage movie really clearly um, precedes us. For example, the first state that. Um, gave women the vote was Colorado, I believe in 1896. So it precedes the automobile um, as, a, as a social phenomenon um, in many ways. So suffrage, the suffrage movement was well underway, but um, an important key of the suffragette movement was mobilizing women, of getting women to be fired up about this, to communicate this and articulate it and made it part of the way they were think. It wasn't just about convincing men. And there were, there were a lot of men who were behind the suffrage movement. There's a lot of men who were behind feminist movements. And, but getting women on board was something that the car did fundamentally because it really said, here's this opportunity. And all of a sudden we can see, and this really clearly articulates kind of the divided world that we live in and the opportunities that are out there. It created a means for women to organize and meet. It, it uh, gave an opportunity for talent to emerge of women who could provide charismatic leadership. It gave an outlet for distributing information, pamphlets, flyers, booklets. And so it became a really fundamental tool of the organizational side of the suffrage movement. Sorry, that was an old historian thing. Oh, but, that was great. That was that's, great. An, that's an amazing, that's a really great question. Yeah. So we have a comment, comment and, and question here from, uh, from a gentleman. My wife is a considerably better driver than I am and has done NASCAR during the days of Richard Petty, open wheel rallying and various other forms of driving. I have restored a Model A, so I prefer to, to, I prefer to travel more slowly I'm quite comfortable with my wife's skill set, but most, but why aren't fellow men? Is it, you, you have, uh, any of you have suppositions about why, D does that still persist? I, I know in my house, I, 
I drive because my husband doesn't like me pointing out how he should drive. So he, so I just drive. So what do you think? That's a touchy one. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great point. And, and I think that um, automotive in general and driving has always been perceived as a male sport or a male um, skill set. And um, there's just kind of a, a mindset that goes along with that. And as Ken has educated us on very well today, women in the space have been there for since the beginning and have had quite a significant role in automotive, but it is still thought of as a male sport and, and um, skill. So, um, Ken, give a male <laughs> perspective on this one. Oh, no, I, I, was, I, was just I was just reflecting on, um, from the very beginning, even though women were completely engaged in the automobile, there was at the very beginning, there was a pushback about women drivers. It was a fundamental pushback. And I was thinking about Joan Cuneo, you know, um, there's, there's all kinds of photographic archives of her. You should look at them, but out there changing her tires. And Alice Ramsey in 1909, when she did the transcontinental role, um, started in New York, she was sitting there in the car and they were getting ready to leave. And a guy came out to start a car for her. And she said, no, we're starting our own car. And she changed her tires 11 times. And then within the suffrage movement with among the suffragettes they said we've got to show them that we can drive we can show them we've got to show them that the mechanical barrier is something that is made up and so and the the r really rough tough the rough part of this is maintaining the socially acceptable or self-defined feminine roles and integrating that with mechanical skills and driving, but the 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 narrative of the woman dr driver is something that's absolutely persisted across history. You're absolutely right in that, and the the mechanical side of it. I think you've hit such a, a great point there. And there's also um, a safety factor, right? In especially early years, driving was often considered dangerous, and so yeah. a woman shouldn't do it because it was dangerous. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that um, in, in my role and, and position that somebody finds out that I work on the vehicles I drive and they're astounded by it. And I said, would you have that same reaction towards a guy that was talking about working on his car? No, I'm, I'm a car person at the end of the day, but it is that mentality of the roles. There's a follow-up, uh, there's a question that ties into that, and it's addressed to you, Tabitha. It's, as a car person, do you look at life through a car lens? If you see something on the news, do you find yourself bouncing its meaning off of how it affects car ownership? It's mm, a great question. Um, probably, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, just because I truly am a driver, and that is, the, the keys are the, the, my freedom in, in many ways, many regards, so I want to... Um, be sure that that's protected and, and that I'm able to enjoy that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, that's probably just because that's the world that I, I live and operate in every day. Um, that's, that's a good pers perspective. I, I can't say that I consciously do it, but I can almost guarantee subconsciously because that's, I think as a avid car person, we probably all do. I'm going to read, let's redirect that to Abby. How does, how does your love of cars change your life on a daily basis? Do you feel it? Um, a little bit because, you know, especially like at the high school, like it's not something I can just walk up to one of my friends and start talking about because they don't know it and they don't understand it. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I have to not hide it, but not necessarily be talking about it all the time because it, it'll just go over their heads. They won't understand you know, why I went out to the garage last night and was, you know, working on my rear end or something. They just won't understand that. So it's one of those things where I have to balance how much I talk about it and who I talk about it with. Because there's also the kids at the school who want to talk about their sports car. Yeah. And I just, and that's something that I don't understand. Like, I don't understand the whole wanting it to be loud and be able to go from zero to 60 in 30 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever. Does, is this part is this part of how you understand your uniqueness i mean isn't this does this kind of buttress your confidence and self-identity because you know this is you yeah yeah huh that's very cool 
This, this may require less thought. Uh, Abby, when you started up the Model T with the crank and the video, it looked quite smooth. Have you ever experienced a near Ford fracture with the handle? Um, I, for, on me, no, but I have watched someone else. We were on a car tour a couple of years ago and a former student at the college broke his arm on my grandpa's car. So. You, you can name him, by the way. <laughs> let's, let's do the walk of shame. Matt Goyce broke his arm. <laughs> <laughs> our, we're sorry laughing at your injury, but. Uh, <laughs> we love you, Matt. We love Matt, so. Uh, so, Abby, maybe you can explain that, what that reference is for people who may not have ever cranked a Model T before. So, on the Model T, it has a spark lever, and um, if it's not retarded all the way, it will kick back and break your arm essentially. Yeah. So here's a question for you. Aesthetics versus technical or performance oriented features in an antique or vintage or classic car, what comes first? Do you look at what it looks like or how it performs or what kind of technical innovations it might have? Abby, you wanna start with that one? Okay, so I know like from being around my um, dad and grandpa, you know, when they go out and look at a car, they're looking at, is it going to be able to run before they look at what it looks like? And same for me, like if it's not going to run and it's going to take a lot of work, then it's not necessarily something that I want to get into right then because it's going to take, whereas, you know, if the paint's chipped or something, you can still drive it. You know, it might not look the best, but you can still drive and enjoy it in that way. Okay. Totally depends on what the purpose of my usage is for it. Um, I, there are very few vehicles that I dislike um, and many, a long list that I do. And, and uh, again, it, it kind of depends on what the purpose of it is. If, if I have a vehicle that it's solely intended for the great drives and the tight corners are on the track, absolutely, performance, handling, um, all of that. If it's for just a cruiser, just the enjoyment, um, quite honestly, my preference is pre-war American classics. So your big Packards and Duesenbergs and your Cadillac V16s, the craftsmanship and the design elements that are in those vehicles is astounding. And, um, you know, the Model T, as simplistic as it is, there's a beauty in that. And I enjoy something like that just as much as the 911 Porsche that happens to be in my garage from a friend right now. So different uses, different days, and quite honestly, different moods. You've got good friends that are loaning you those kinds of cars. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lawnmower in my garage. <laughs> a few motorcycles too. A motorcycle, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, I think that we're going to call it a day here on Wheels of Change. I want to encourage you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, McPherson College Auto Restoration. We're on Twitter and Instagram as MC Auto Resto. And I encourage you to get that link out of the chat and make sure or the, it's in the chat and the Q&A. And take a tour of what Templeton Hall and McPherson College looks like here in Kansas. And so uh, final words, Dr. Yon. Hi. Um, thank Tabitha. you. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you all. It's been great. Thank you. All right. Happy motoring. <laughs>